Hi, everyone. It's just about that time, and uh, hello and good afternoon. Thank you for joining us as we share an overview of the ArchivesSpace public user interface. Please note this webinar is being recorded, and you probably all saw a pop-up for that just now. So today we have some early adopters from Grand Valley State University sharing some valuable insight on how the PUI has affected their day-to-day -day responsibilities of providing access to finding aid, as well as public reception and adapting their instruction for students and researchers. This overview is followed by two institutions with different strategies to roll out the PUI by early next year. Presenting today, we have Mark Custer, an archivist and metadata coordinator at the Beinecke Rare Book and Manuscript Library. He has been heavily involved with the implementation of ArchivesSpace at Yale University, and he is the former chair of the ArchivesSpace Public User Interface Enhancement Project. We also have Susan Pazinski, Associate Librarian at Houghton Library for Technical Services at Harvard University. She worked closely with the ArchivesSpace PUI Enhancement Working Group. She is also leading a project to replace Harvard's archival discovery system. And we have Annie Benefiel, the Archivist for Collection Management at Grand Valley State University. She oversees the accessioning, processing, and preservation of archival and manuscript collections and manages metadata for archival and digital collections in the Special Collections and University Archives. And finally, we have Lee Rupinski, Archivist for Public Services and Community Engagement also at Grand Valley State University. She is responsible for instruction, reference, assessment, and other outreach activities for special collections and university archives. Thank you all for joining us today, and we'll have Mark kick us off with an overview of the PUI Enhancement Project. We'll hold for questions at the end. All right, thank you, Kim, and hello, everybody. At the Archive Space Members Forum in July, I provided a brief introduction of the Archive Space Public Use Interface Enhancement Project by focusing on the project's overall timeline. For today's webinar, I'm going to introduce the new Public Use Interface by reflecting on the design stage of the PUI project, which kicked off when the PUI Working Group was formed in 2015. This group was comprised of volunteer archivists, including myself, an Archive Space developer, a representative from Lyricis, and the services of a design firm, the Cherry Hill Company. For a period of roughly six months, the group met virtually every two weeks to come up with an overall set of recommendations that would provide the development roadmap for the new interface. One of the first things that this group did was to conduct a set of usability tests on the original Archive Space PUI. While conducting those tests, we discovered a few high-priority updates that we wanted to recommend immediately. But we also discussed the positive features that come along with using the Archive Space PUI in conjunction with the staff interface. Here's an overview of just a few of those features. Speaking as someone at an institution who does not yet use the PUI, I must say that I am most excited about the near instant publication feature that will be provided to our staff once we make the switch. The PUI also provides the convenient feature to search across repositories, which we cannot do in the staff interface currently, as well as the ability to search within a single collection. Last, I also wanted to mention that the original PUI does a great job with providing theming and customization options with the Archive Space plugin architecture. Since I find that it's always easier to show the effects of what plugins can do in Archive Space rather than talk about how that architecture works in general, Here's an example of one of my favorite PUI plugins, which is in production at the University, excuse me, University of Louisville. Notice how U of L has added this amazing help page to their PUI instance. This is something that the working group discussed adding to the enhanced PUI in version 2.1, but it was unfortunately one of those features that we didn't have the time to scope out adequately. However, I think that this is a fantastic plug-in example, and I would love to see it contributed to the core code as a starting point for a public help page. Now, I'm going to show a summary of the brand new features that actually did make it into the 2.1 release. I won't take the time to cover every new feature in today's introduction, but I would like to discuss two of them. First, we'll look at enhanced search results, and second, we'll look at uh, the new archival inheritance feature. 
So let's take a look at the search results page. Here, I've spun up two instances of, our, of archive space, connected them to copies of the same database, and I have then run the same search in each instance. On the left-hand side, you'll see the four results provided by version 1.5 of archive space. It's a very clean look with subtle icons to differentiate between the three archival object results and the one collection level result. But what we heard from the usability tests and from staff users even before we conducted the usability tests was that there was not enough information provided for researchers to understand what they were looking at. In one of the usability tests that I conducted, for example, a researcher was quite puzzled with a search result from Yale's corpus that simply had a hyperlinked title of Neruda, comma, Pablo, 1966. In actuality, that result represented contact sheets of negatives taken of Pablo Neruda at the Penn International Meeting in 1966. But as the researcher tried to reason aloud about what she was looking at, she thought to herself, well, I know that Pablo Neruda won the Nobel Peace Prize around this time, so maybe if I click on this search result, I'll, found out, I'll find out more information about that. Of course, that wasn't what the atomized archival component title meant to convey at all, but it didn't stand much of a chance torn from the context of its finding aid like that. And that's why, on the right-hand side of the screen, you'll see that there is a lot more information provided in the search results in version 2.1. I wouldn't say that we have things perfect just yet, of course, but you'll notice that some descriptive information appears here, as well as a hierarchy of links that are intended to reflect each uh, intended to reflect each result's context in the overall system. And if we take a closer look at this page in version 2.1, you might even be able to notice that all four of these results are connected, since they're all part of the Seward Collins papers at the Beinecke Library. Now, let's imagine that I've decided to select this first search result so that we can compare what the landing page for Mrs. G.K. Chesterton looks like in the side-by-side -side versions of the PUI. There are two things that I'd like to note here. The first is that many of the Cherry Hill recommendations focused on consolidating the presentation of data as well as reducing jargon. On the left-hand side of the screen, look at the section called Instances, for instance. You'll see a lot of odd labels reapplied from the staff interface here, such as Container 1 Type, Container 2 Indicator, and even the term Instances. All this information is presented on this page simply to indicate that these materials are housed in box 3, folder 88. On the right-hand side of the screen, you'll notice um, how that same information has been condensed into a different display. You might also notice that there is some information on the right-hand side of the screen that's not present in version 1.5. That's due to the new archival inheritance feature. Let's take a quick look at that by looking more closely at this view in 2.1. I'm not going to go over the details during this webinar of how the new archival inheritance feature works or how it can be configured based on local uh, preferences. Instead, I just want to illustrate that this language of materials note um, has been inherited, and so has this information, uh, excuse me, this access restrictions note, as well as this uh, extent note that's been inherited from the series level. If you'd like um, a brief overview of, the, of how this new feature works, I'd recommend checking out this short video, which fo focuses exclusively on covering the archival inheritance feature. So that's enough about two of the new features that you'll find in the new PUI. What features are missing? Well, here's the list of Cherry Hill recommendations that we were not able to include with the July release. I think that each of these features are important, so I hope that they will arrive with future, future releases, and I'm gladdened by the fact that already work continues to um, progress and make the PUI even better. For three quick examples, I want to thank Thomas Adams for reporting a bug that went unnoticed before the 2.1 release. Uh, Stephen Majewski also provided an update to the new PUI PDF export process so that the PDFs will now include the appropriate repository branding image if that's present in the staff interface. And last, quite recently, Laura Woodford has submitted a patch to improve how the relevancy rankings in the PUI work out of the box. There have also been a lot more updates provided by other developers since the July release, which has been fantastic to see. Now that I've covered a few of the features provided with the new Archive Space PUI, I'd like to conclude this, conclude this introduction by asking the question, who's using the Archive Space PUI? This question has been in my mind since I started working on this project. 
In May of 2016, I decided to try and find as many live sites as I could. At that time, I came up with a total of 31 sites. Just last week, I decided to put my searching skills to work again to see how many sites in the wild that I could find. I know that I haven't found them all yet, but as of last week, I counted a total of 48 institutions using the PUI, with 40% of those institutions using the newly reversed, uh, excuse me, newly released version of Archive Space, which just came out a few months ago. I should note that this count does not include institutions like Yale, however, since we don't allow search engines to index our PUI site just yet. Once we do allow our site to be indexed, though, I will count us amongst this group. This group of 48 does include Grand Valley State University, however, which is one of the institutions represented here on this slide, since they have been using the Archive Space PUI since 2014, before the PUI Enhancement Group was even formed. To hear more about their experience with Archive Space, I will now turn things over to Annie and Lee. Thanks, Mark. Uh, I'm Annie Benefield, the Archivist for Collection Management at Grand Valley State University, and I'm going to talk a little bit about um, our use of Archive Space from sort of a collection management, back of the house point of view, and Lee is going to talk about it more from a front of the house point of view. Uh, I'd like to point out um, that both of our positions are new within the past year or so, um, though I've been here for two years uh, prior to that change in the role of assistant archivist. Lee joined us in February of this year. A little bit about Grand Valley State University. Uh, we're a comprehensive university with about 25,000 students on two campuses in West Michigan. We're classified as a master's large institution, and our philosophy emphasizes liberal education and experiential learning. We're a relatively young university, founded in 1960, and over the past few decades, we've been experiencing significant growth. The university libraries are home to the university's archives, which was established in the early 1970s, and special collections of books and manuscripts, which was established in the early 1990s. The two units were bundled together in the mid-90s, and moved into its own small building, the Seedman House, which is a short walk from the main campus library. The department is staffed by a director and two archivists, Lee and myself, and all of us are full-time library faculty, and we have student workers for about 20 hours per week. Our collections are varied. We have about 3,700 linear feet of archival and manuscript materials, and about 35,000 volumes in the rare and special book collections. Our collecting strengths are in Grand Valley history, the Civil War and slavery, 20th century wars and veterans, Michigan literature, art, and general regional history. Prior to migra migrating to archive space, we kept collection metadata in a few different places. We had an instance of archivist toolkit, which had been populated over the previous few years with accessions, finding aid data, names, and subjects. The previous university archivist had several student interns who encoded and imported EAD into the Archivist Toolkit, but the EAD files had never been used in any other way. We had also a lot of finding aids and inventories that still existed only as Word documents. The only finding aids that had ever been shared online were the PDF versions of those Word documents, and they were shared in our ContentDM digital repository. Only the finding aids for processed manuscript collections had been put into ContentDM, so there was no online access for finding aids for university record series. In 2014, Lyricist managed the migration of our data from Archivist Toolkit into our Archive Space instance, which is also hosted by Lyricist. The data migration was successful, but it needed a lot of additional cleanup and standardization to get the finding aids ready for publication. I'll admit up front that the cleanup process is still ongoing as I find problems and have time or students to work on cleanup. But the initial phase took, uh, took me about six months of learning how to use archive space, going through all of our metadata, and running through tasks like standardizing note fields and order, making sure all of our agents that were linked as creators or subjects in finding aids were published and merged with duplicate entries, merging duplicate subject headings, applying classification groupings to our different collecting areas, and finally publishing all of the data in about 500 resource records. Some upcoming projects that I'd like to continue to, uh, to work on to improve our metadata in archive space include linking finding aids to related accession records and marking the collections as processed, adding the remaining legacy finding aids and inventories to the database as we continue to process them, 
and continuing to add new accessions, process collections, and publish new resource records regularly. From my standpoint as the primary collection manager overseeing processing that is often done by students and managing our metadata, archive space has been a huge time saver. We have a fairly streamlined process for creating finding aids. For single level description, we either write directly into the staff interface or we write it into a Word document template that I can have myself or students copy and paste the data into the archive space fields. Multi-level finding aids are a little bit trickier, but we use an Excel to EAD workflow uh, that was created and shared generously by Mark Custer to create our box list and uh, with as much hierarchy as we might want, and then I use Oxygen to transform that into an EAD file that can be imported into archive space. Uh, and then we add in the collection level metadata manually as we would with single level description. However, once the metadata is in the system, it's very easy for me to publish or unpublish with one click. I can also publish finding aids in stages if I'm processing uh, a collection one bit at a time. The links to finding aids are stable, so it's easy for me to link directly to them from other places on the web, such as our website or related digital object records. And now Archive Space also has an OAI PMH responder that will enable us to publish all of our resource all of our published resource records to be harvested by the University Library's Discovery Layer Summon. This integration also frees me from having to create additional MARC records to be ingested into our library catalog, which is another big time saver for me. Now, I don't mean to suggest that the system is perfect. There's still plenty of room for improvement. For my workflow, the biggest problems with the staff interface remain that it's difficult to do major revisions to finding aids. I also find getting uh, to box location information in the staff interface a little bit cumbersome. Another major issue is that note fields are not expandable within the staff interface, so it can be challenging to read and edit them. I'm also not in love with the, with the default PDF style sheet, um, and I know that you can submit your own PDF uh, style sheet, but I don't have the uh, experience with XSLT to make that adjustment that I would like to see happen. So hopefully we'll get a new one soon. Lyris has rolled out the new public user interface for us a couple of months ago. And since the update, we decided to get some user feedback on the site. We worked with our user experience librarian to develop some search scenarios and asked 16 of the library's undergraduate user experience assistants to run through them and share their observation of the site and its contents. The first scenario involved searching archive space and identifying relevant results for comparing multiple drafts of an author's screenplay. The second involved locating both physical and digital versions of World War II photographs, and the third involved finding three potential primary sources related to women's activism. We asked participants to copy the links of their search results so that we could determine if they were on the right track, and we asked them to share whether or not they felt successful in their searches, what was the most useful about the site, what was confusing about the site, any terminology that they found confusing, and any recommended improvements. The students particularly liked the prominent citation button, the ability to refine searches with faceted terms, and how much potential content each relevant collection had listed within its inventory. Go back to that. However, the stu students overall found the site very confusing to navigate. They found performing keyword searches difficult and were confused by the search results, and they noted that it was very unclear how to access relevant materials once they had located the record for it. What we've learned from this early test is that there are three layers of potential improvement. First, the archive space infrastructure, the search function and overall navigability of the site, which is largely out of our control. Second is our metadata. We have a lot more control here. And one of the things I want to do in response to this testing is to change the text of our conditions governing access notes to include more information about just how to access uh, how to gain access to the materials, instead of merely listing the restrictions or acknowledging that the collection is open for research. Finally, there's an archival literacy layer. A lot of the students found the archival terminology confusing. Uh, and while these students are a little bit more experienced with traditional library research, they're very inexperienced with archives. So now I'm going to turn it over to Lee, and she's going to talk a little bit about her role in our department and how she is working on improving archival literacy. Thanks, Annie. 
So before we dive into that third layer that Annie identified, I want to give you a little bit more background about my role here at Grand Valley. As Annie mentioned, I am the Archivist for Public Services and Community Engagement as of February of this year. So this position was specifically created to address the issue of engagement with our materials. At Grand Valley, we're concerned with supporting the teaching mission of the university. So one of our core user groups is undergraduate students. So most of my talk is going to focus on how to reach that specific user population. In my capacity as the outreach archivist, I'm a primary user of the public interface. That's where most of my work happens. Since reference falls into my position description, I assist users with searching the interface as well as conducting searches frequently to answer remote reference requests to find sources relevant for instructional sessions or workshops I'm planning or topics for social media postings. I perform basic qualitative metadata quality control when I or one of our users finds confusing or incorrect metadata, which is part of the ongoing cleanup that Annie mentioned. But what I do is often very small fixes like grammar and misspellings, and if things are more complicated, I take that feedback to Annie for final adjustments. Prior to coming to Grand Valley, I worked as a collection manager slash loan arranger at my last institution, where we also adopted archive space early on for both public and staff functionality. So I have some familiarity with how the staff interface operates and how the old PUI functioned as well. So now I want to talk about that third layer of improvement, archival literacy. I've put together a small bar chart to show the words from the archive space interface that students identified as confusing in our experience survey. The largest category here you'll notice is students who reported that they were not actually confused by any of the terminology. I'm working with 15 student responses here and disregarding one survey that did not follow any directions at all, which was a specific uh, issue of its own. So six out of 15 students said they were not confused by anything, but many of those students still had issues understanding the interface in some way, either how they were supposed to access the materials, how to navigate the page, or how to refine their searches. One student commented that terminology was not confusing, just the entire website, which implies to me that some words probably are confusing but the student was too overwhelmed with the unfamiliarity of the system itself to identify those individual sticking points. So after that main category, we have students finding the words repository and extent the most confusing. Other words that trip students up included series, collection, abstract, box, and item. But there is a difference in types of confusion. Students genuinely didn't understand what the word repository meant, and several commented that they did look it up. Uh, while they do understand what box means, but they don't understand why we're talking about boxes. So for someone with no familiarity with archives, even basic terms are more confusing when presented in this abstracted environment without visual aids. So they're used to conducting research and looking for distinctions between books and scholarly and non-scholarly articles, and this is something totally different. So what does collection mean, and what frame of reference can we give them to help them understand those differences? A number of other pain points were revealed from our small user sample. First, several students identified that they had difficulty knowing how to get started searching. Several mentioned difficulties with keyword searches, and a few particularly mentioned that allowing filtering from this first screen uh, by having popular search topics or categories might help users who just want to browse. Archive space itself is geared towards users who know what they want to find, but is less intuitive for the average student who doesn't really know all the resources we have or exactly what they want to find, but has parameters defined by an assignment. Another student pointed out that using a very specific search phrase yielded many results and made it hard to find exactly what they were looking for. So this is a major difference in archival searching from library catalog searches. In our first scenario, we asked students to find two versions of Jim Harrison's novel Wolf in the collection. Uh, we have a novel, a screenplay, and then several draft forms, so any of those would have been acceptable results. A search for Wolf and Jim Harrison yields 29 results in archive space, and by doing various uh, different keyword or title searches, I yielded only greater numbers of results, anywhere from 32 to 58 results. But a similar search in the library catalog only ever gives me three results. So they're uh, sort of overwhelmed by what they're seeing. It's good information, but they think they've been very specific, and they're seeing these huge amounts of results. So there's a dissonance at work for them. Finally, students reported not understanding how to actually find the materials. Some thought that there should be request links. Others said they'd email us for access. And some were confused about the language reading room itself used in our scenarios, because that kind of specialized lingo hadn't been introduced to them yet prior to working on the exercise, which added an additional layer of uncertainty about how they actually saw these materials. So the biggest questions we had from the survey results are listed here, and we don't necessarily have answers to all of them yet. These are often beyond the scope of archive space, while others can be partially addressed within the system. So how do we help new users understand what kinds of resources live in the archives? 
Do users know what they're looking for, and should they need to know what they're looking for before they find it? How do we help remote users understand circulation restrictions on access? Uh, since they're often not going to be in our reading room to ask us these questions, how do we communicate the differences between a library and an archive to them at this critical point of access? How do we increase student understanding of archival jargon? And the related question, where can we flex standards to accommodate our user population? So the onus is not always on the student to understand our words. We need to meet them where they're comfortable. Annie has uh, been talking with me about one of the changes that she would like to make. We currently use the conditions governing access note in archive space, uh, which is formatted correctly to DAC guidelines. But we would like to change that note to an access to materials that allows them to understand where these materials actually live and how to get access to them. So we're making a conscious choice to deviate from the standard in order to better serve our user population. And there may be other instances where we can do similar things. We've identified several possible solutions for some of these questions. Uh, there's definitely a need for increased education in archival terminology and understanding of archives themselves and how they operate. I'm sure that's not surprising to anyone. Uh, but this can't be addressed in one easy fix. So some possibilities. We could provide definitions for commonly misunderstood words or jargon using the pop-up feature like we have in the staff interface so that uh, when they hover over a section, they could see sort of that simplified definition the same way that when we hover in the staff interface, we see the DAX requirements for that field. Uh, through Lyricist, we have a few options to customize our home page for archive space. This includes the possibility of an about field where we could include a link to a more thorough search tips page or subject guide section on understanding terminology or walkthroughs. However, we need to be mindful that if the solution involves too many extra steps, users, especially at that undergraduate level, are much more likely to stop and just look for something else to use than continue forward. Other solutions uh, will take a more sustained effort over time. Uh, one option is to take more advantage of instruction time to build how to use archive space tutorials into lessons for students that are likely to use it for research assignments. This could include providing walkthrough tutorials step-by-step -step guides or glossaries to the professors to include in their Blackboard or Moodle uh, modules as well. We can offer workshops to students, faculty, and other librarians so that they can learn how to use archive space and we can easily repeat those uh, as the need or desire for them arises. And we can create subject guides. I already have a LibGuide for special collections and university archives that I direct users to that includes video walkthroughs of how to navigate our website and the parts of a finding aid. Something very similar could be done for multiple search scenarios so that we could sort of create likely scenarios by different undergraduate disciplines to help market them to students so that they can see an example of how they would use the system. My current subject guide also includes a glossary that has words like repository and collection within it, but the definitions are adapted from SAA's glossary. And I think adding in more specific examples and, and including more terms based on this feedback may be useful. The Learn the Terms campaign is a sample that you see on the slide. This was designed by one of our liaison librarians, Gail Schwab, in connection with the art department. And it encourages students to learn the terms that we use uh, for information literacy. And in this list, you can see abstract, which is one of our confusing that's already been identified in primary source have been suggested for her next round uh, for educating students on these words. So there may be a potential point of collaboration here. Uh, with Gail and the art students to create a mini campaign just for archival terminology, or we may be able to run our own version in some way. And finally, it's important to remember to educate other librarians. Here at Grand Valley, librarians have very limited exposure to archives, so my outreach includes targeted efforts towards librarians themselves. Uh, so that may include crashing departmental meetings, sending out additional emails, running workshops, whatever the case may be, but they're often our greatest allies in hitting that student line first and helping everyone feel more comfortable with the ambiguity of using an unfamiliar system. So we definitely have opportunities here to improve the archival literacy of our students, but it will take ongoing investigation to find out what's the most effective and what your areas need to have deeper discussions and more in-depth guidance. And now I'm going to pass it over to Mark to talk more about what they are planning to do. Great, thanks. Um, so hi everybody, it's Mark again. Um, in this next segment, I'm going to provide a high-level overview of Yale's PUI implementation plan. Uh, first though, I want to mention that even though Yale is not using the archive space PUI just yet, we have a long history with archive space. In fact, when the project was originally funded, Mark Matienzo, then working at Yale's Manuscripts and Archives Department, was appointed Technical Architect of Archive Space. Two years later, Yale University became a charter member of Archive Space. 
About two years after that, uh, Maureen Callahan and I worked diligently to migrate three separate Archivist Toolkit databases into a single ArchivesSpace application. Jump ahead another two years, and now my colleague Melissa Wisner is leading Yale's implementation of the ArchivesSpace PUI version 2.1, which was released July 18th. Even before July, though, Melissa has been hard at work identifying the stakeholders for the project, figuring out dependencies, and drafting a general strategy so that Yale will have a successful migration to the new PUI. This slide represents an overview of the project plan that Mer Melissa created in the original project charter. Now, I don't want to give the impression that everyone adopting a new discovery uh, service needs to go through a similar type of process, but since Yale is a large organization with just over 500 employees in the library system, and since we will be migrating away from our current arch archival discovery system, the Yale Finding Aid Database, or YFAD, which staff and researchers are very familiar with, we recognize just how much of a difference any version of the Archive Space PUI presents for us since, as we have already seen, the PUI includes not only finding aids, but also information about archival creators, the ability to discover atomized collection components on their own, and more. Additionally, one of the Yale institutions that holds archival collections, the Peabody Museum of Natural History, does not use the Archive Space staff interface, but they still need to have their collection material discoverable in the PUI just like they do now in YFAD. For those reasons and more, it was crucial for us to pull together a large group of people to participate in the project actively so that the implementation and the transition will be a success. We are aiming to launch the new PUI in early 2018, and since we have a lot of work to do to get there, uh, Melissa has formed a project team that is composed of six subgroups. So as I already mentioned, Melissa is the project lead, but we also have a documentation and staff training group, which is being led by Emily. This group plans to create some short video introductions to our PUI, as well as conduct in-person staff trainings shortly before our official launch. Next, we have the data cleanup group, which is being led by Alicia and Chris. This group will be working on a variety of cleanup projects, such as adding machine-readable re dates to our lower-level description, since the new PUI supports the, abil the ability to search, filter, and sort by dates. Steve is leading the technical integrations group, which is making sure that everything goes smoothly while we transition from our current system, YFAD, to the new PUI. Just as one example, since our libguides at Yale reference YFAD frequently, this group is working to make sure that none of those links will break next year. Allison is, our leading, Allison is leading our PUI enhancements group, and I'll show an example of that group's work in just a moment. Next is the usability and accessibility group, which is led by Jen. This group has created a framework to conduct additional usability tests on our PUI, which the testers will be able to, to participate in completely online at their own convenience. Finally, we have the publicity and branding group, which is being led by Mike Morand. I'm really excited about what this group will come up with. From what I've seen so far, this group is not only aware that it's important to get the word out about a new discovery system, but it's just as important, if not more so, to take the, this opportunity um, to find new ways to bring in uh, new engagements with the community. Of course, given that we have about 25 different staff members working in six different groups, communication is important. To make sure that everyone is aware of what's going on, we have three par primary methods to keep everyone informed. The first is a monthly all-member meeting, which is open to everyone in the library. The second is an in-house Slack channel that we use for informal discussions about the project. And the third is Asana, which is the project management application that Melissa selected for us to use during this uh, implementation period. And we're using Asana, which is a web-based application to track, to track all of our work, essentially. So here's an example of Allison's PUI enhancements group uh, view in Asana. In this screenshot, you will notice that the group is identifying and then prioritizing updates that we would like to see in the PUI. For example, the column on the left-hand side of the screen includes issues that have been selected to send to Lyricist to ask if they can address any of those particular issues for us, since Lyricist hosts our instance of archive space. Next, I wanted to mention one other group whose work is important to Yale's PUI launch. And this group is being led by Karen Spiker and has been meeting actually for almost two years now to come up with a plan for us to clean up and more actively manage our subject and agent holdings, or headings, excuse me, in archive space. As I mentioned earlier, at Yale, we migrated into archive space from three separate AT databases. 
And I should add that all of those subject and agent headings in the AT had been copied over at various times from, a, from our integrated library system. But since we had three AT databases, and for a variety of other reasons, things really got out of sync. So Karen's group is getting us back into sync. Uh, my fav two favorite achieve achievements of this group are the fact that, one, Yale has a new set of documented best practices that explain how to reuse and create subject and agent records in archive space, which all the units are using now. And two, for every authorized subject and name heading that we have in our data set, we have added its corresponding URI. This last accomplishment is really exciting to me, since having the URIs in archive space will really cement the fact that the authority work has been done, and it also allows us to update our agent records with more information, such as alternative name forms. Additionally, the new PUI surfaces these URIs for search engines by embedding bits of metadata in the underlying HTML. At the bottom of the screen, you can see an example of the metadata for our record about David Nelson Beach, which includes his authority URI from the Library of Congress. When Karen's group started this project, zero URIs attached to our, to our archival descriptive records. Today, though, we have over 31,000 distinct URIs, which occur over, over 100,000 times in our entire data set. Of course, I don't have time to highlight all the good work uh, that each of these groups have undertaken so far, so if you'd like to follow our progress, I encourage you to check out Yale's Archive Space blog. In September, Melissa Wisner wrote an excellent post that covers the concepts of a before action review. Just this month, Allison Clemens published a nice write-up about the work that her group has done so far to help ensure the PUI will be useful for both staff and researchers alike. We aim to have at least one post each month from now until March, so we will continue to share information about our progress, as well as how we attempt to measure our success, what we've learned along the way, and how things have changed during the process. That is everything that I wanted to share today about Yale's implementation plan, so I'll now turn things over to Susan. Hello, it's a pleasure to be able to give an overview of the Harvard process for implementing the new Archive Space PUI. I'd really like to thank Christine Kim for all her work in putting this webinar together, and my fellow colleagues for their great presentations. So like Yale, Harvard is in the midst of their implementation of the new PUI but we've been preparing for it for quite a while, over two years, in fact. So a little bit about archival discovery in 2015 at Harvard. We have approximately 40 separate repositories um, with varying sizes at Harvard. And um, within that context, in 2015, we had 6,134 EAD finding aids in our OASIS archival discovery system. And that included approximately 2 million components. So we are quite large. Um, the Harvard OASIS archival system was built in the mid-1990s, and both its infrastructure and user interface were outdated, um, while we had done some enhancements and tweaks. In that about 20 years, we've never done a major rebuild or anything like that. Within the Harvard repositories, we've had no shared method of finding aid creation. Each repository has to um, develop their own methods in how they create the finding aids. And OASIS is simply the storage solution as the back end and then the archival discovery layer. Another thing at Harvard is we have an unknown number of paper finding guides scattered throughout the Harvard library system. And I have to admit this is still an issue that even now we have not yet addressed. And finally, um, some repositories at Harvard use the Aeon circulation system, but most do not. So in 2015, a working group, which I chaired, um, was formed at Harvard to look into how we could improve archival discovery and whether it would be better 
to enhance our OASIS system or whether we should find a new discovery system. Because of the older technology OASIS was built on, it became apparent we either had to build or find a brand new system for archival discovery. We were very reluctant to build a new archival system in-house. However, in the past, it's tended to build their own systems. And we knew from this the enormous cost of continued maintenance and development that entailed. So we wanted to try to avoid doing that. But by deciding to go in the direction of a new system, whatever that would be, in-house or um, something developed outside of Harvard, we knew we had to deal with the back end of OASIS, what to do with all those finding aids and where to store them. Moving everything into archive space became the obvious solution. It would not only be a storage system for our archival descriptive data, but it would finally give the Harvard repositories a consistent shared way of creating and managing our archival description. Let's provide us with collection management functions that we didn't have. So as for the front end in 2015, two possible developments seem promising to us, the proposed new archive space PUI or potentially the ArcLight project. So we had just a little bit of pre-work needed. <laughs> because of the number of EAD finding guides we had, that had been created by different repositories using different standards over the past 20 years, our metadata was wildly inconsistent. And due to size, there are limits to what we could do to clean the data up manually. But over a 16-month period, a group of archivists and metadata specialists plus a programmer managed to extract, clean, normalize, and load our data into archive space. At the same time, they were in constant communication with all the repositories, sharing information, getting feedback, and ensuring that the repositories understood what this move to archive space meant for them. Because this was just a major change. I can't um, emphasize this right enough um, for Harvard repositories to suddenly go um, into archive space. While this work was going on, we had the opportunity to become involved with the development of the new archive space PUI. First at the design phase with the Archive Space Enhancement Working Group that Mark mentioned in his introduction, and then later on working with um, Archive Space on the actual development of the new PUI. At the same time, we also did archival user testing, testing that looked at how our users were searching for archival material. And two big takeaways from that testing was that users really had problems knowing where to start searching, and that once they found archival material they wanted to look at, they didn't know how to actually get it, even who or how to contact the owning repository. And the Granville Valley um, presenters also noted that th this issue in their testing. This latter point inspired us to consider expanding Aon to more Harvard repositories and to um, provide a more consistent um, retrieval experience for patrons and for um, when they were in the archival discovery system rather than having each repository have a different way of um, needing to be contacted and um, getting in touch with materials. So all this led to a two-year project started last spring to expand, to expand Aon use at Harvard. So now, finally, implementing the Archive Space PUI at Harvard. The Archive Space Public User Interface Task Force was formed um, running, and it's running from July 
2017 through March 2018. Um, it's made up of members from various repositories plus a developer assigned to the project, and this group meets weekly. Subgroups are being formed to do the user testing and outreach communication. Again, this is a huge change for us. Um, we've had the same archival discovery system for 20 years, and so moving to a new one and one so different from what we have is really um, a major shift. Along with this group meeting weekly, there are bi-weekly agile meetings of the chairs of this task force and select library services technology staff. We're using um, an agile process with two-week sprints to manage the implementation of the Archive Space PUI here at Harvard. The goal of the Archive Space Public User Task Force is to work to have a beta version up in January 2018 to start getting feedback and do user testing. And our final goal is to have a production version up in the spring of 2018. And of course, another goal for us is the integration of Archive Space and Aeon. This group has also done work on the functional requirements for what we need in the new PUI, um, and also in identifying must-have needs in this first iteration of the PUI. The group has also done work on creating use cases to help in the implementation process. So what are some of the challenges ahead? Um, we've had the same archival discovery system since the mid-1990s. Does it work well? No, but we're used to it. We've had 20 years of it. People have had workarounds with it. Um, you get very familiar with what you've had for a long time. Another change for us is we're very used to a flat file system versus a database structure. So it's a real shift for us to think about um, items and components within archive space appearing with just inherited data rather than just a flat file of the full collection finding aid. And so this is going to be a big change for us. Another thing is having moved to archive space for the back end and now going towards it for the front end, it really forces more consistency among our repositories and a need for us to have more centralized practices and um, really shared best practices. So our metadata issues, as I mentioned, we have a very large database. Um, we've already added a couple of hundred finding aids since 2015, and all this metadata has been created over 20 years in a decentralized process with varying standards. So some of these issues are resolvable, but some are not. There's very much a limit to what we can manually fix in terms of cleaning up our metadata to improve how it displays in the PUI. Another challenge for us is integration with Harvard systems, with other systems here at Harvard. Not only with Aon, but we're now currently moving to a new backend for our online catalog onto Alma. And we also have a proposed new digital collections platform that we're going to be developing shortly. And all this we'd like to see um, much better integrated with each other, more ease of moving metadata around and things like that, and to really look at our systems in a much more holistic manner. Another challenge is Harvard branding, because we don't have enough projects with all of that. We're also moving to a new, completely redesigned Harvard Library web portal, and the implementation is just starting now. This will have effects both on the branding and the look of all our systems, and also this some um, idea that we may be able to do more integration of our discovery systems within the web portal. 
So this is something we're keeping in mind as we're doing development. Um, another challenge is managing user expectations and staff expectations with an iterative project. Archive space TUI is um, changing uh, frequently as it bugs the fix, enhancements are added, and things like that. And we need to be both comfortable with the fact that there will be more iteration with our front end and also realize that um, functionality will develop over time and um, we'll be rolling out that process over time rather than I just wait for the fi quote, final version of the PUI and bring that up. And finally at Harvard, um, as I mentioned, we tend to either build our systems in-house or we've um, purchased vendor products. And this is the first time we've ever really worked with an open source and community-based product. And so for us, it's been a challenge to figure out how we handle that and what our role in it is, both within Harvard and within the archive space community. But we're really excited. We think this is an enormous opportunity for us um, to be moving to a brand new front end that will have functionality that we've never had before. And so we are, despite all the hard work we've done and need to do, are quite excited. So thanks. All right, thank you, Mark, Annie, Lee, and Susan for sharing all of your experiences. We will now open up the audio to everyone and open up the floor for questions. Um, if you have any experiences or insights you'd also like to share, uh, please feel free to, to uh, share your input and uh, introduce your name and institutional affiliation if possible. Thank you so much. All right, I think everyone has audio now. Um, if you're not going to speak, go ahead and mute yourself. So if you guys are still thinking of questions, I can warm us, warm us up. I have a question for all of you guys. Um, uh, what kind of institutional challenges in terms of staffing or resources did you face either before, during, or after implementing um, the, the public interface? I can speak to that a little bit. Um, we adopted the public user interface practically immediately when we adopted ArchivesSpace. So as soon as our data was migrated into ArchivesSpace, it was visible online. So when I first came to Grand Valley, my first job was actually to start cleaning up that data and make sure that all of the information that we were presenting through that interface was um, presentable and understandable. Um, so I would say, resource-wise, the challenge was um, just being unfamiliar with the system and only having, uh, well, one person to do that work. So um, I think had we known a little bit more about the, how the system worked to begin with, um, we probably wouldn't have made that same decision to have our um, archive space live and online from the get-go. We may have taken a little bit more time um, to to get everything presentable before we publish everything um, uh, and made it visible to the public. Actually, I, I saw a question come in um, from Jonathan Will, uh, mentioning that at MoMA, the finding aids are very frequently discovered through Google and asking how discoverable um, archive space records are by Google. Uh, this is something I don't have any <laughs> real knowledge of yet, aside from the fact that when I was looking for folks who are using archive space, I was relying almost 100% on just searching the open web and trying to find um, institutions out there who are using archive space. So the sites are definitely can be indexed, um, and definitely are being indexed. Now, is, if every single, com I know that some folks have had issues with trying to get Google to index, like, you know, every single component of a finding aid in certain systems. So I don't know about the comprehensiveness that the indexing is taking place with Google. But my hope is, is that search engines um, have a very, uh, you know, are easily able to uh, index these sites. But there probably are a few uh, areas of the site that you might want to instruct 
search engines not to you know go down looking like in the you know search pages and some other pages. And I think that um, there's this might have a pretty standard robots.txt file that they use to to indicate that. And I'll try to um, look for one of those examples and provide a link in a second. Uh, but I would I don't know if anyone else, um, whether Annie or Lee. Um, Anyone else watching has experience with seeing Google, you know, searching or archive space PUI or not searching it? I just did a Google search for one of our collections while you were talking, and the collection level result was the only result drawn from archive space, and it was the second result on the Google page. The first one was a library article about the collection, so um, it does seem to do it at the collection level and at the top of the result list. Yeah, so that could be room for improvement, if that's the case. Hi, I was going to respond to uh, Vivian Lee's question about being a lone arranger and finding time to work on archive space. Um, my recommendation as a sort of almost kind of lone arranger is just to chip away at it. Um, also, if you have students or interns or volunteers, um, a lot of the material or all, a lot of the metadata can be input manually. There's also um, uh, a rapid data entry function of archive space. So you can definitely um, set your volunteers or students to doing data entry from existing finding aids if you have those. Vivian, I would chime in that I used to be that sole lone arranger who and I, I very infrequently had student help so that rapid data entry form is very helpful uh, to getting that work done. I'm just going to pick up another question here. Sorry, since I saw it was um, asking about the screenshots from my first presentation. So this is from the University of Minnesota Libraries um, asking that um, we're saying that search results for files and other subcomponents included the collection call number in the display and saying that this is not the case in their implementation of the PUI and asking if that was some kind of customization. So that actual data is a part of the normal display, but what we did was we just changed the label from identifier to call number. Um, and so we also had those uh, set up to be inherited uh, in a composite fashion uh, using the new archival inheritance feature. But in, in the case of the screenshots, all we did was change the label um, from identifier to call number. And I can send an example of that later after this webinar. I also see, it, sorry, um, if anyone else wants to chime in, but I see a question here from UNC Charlotte um, asking about customization of the collection landing page. Yeah, good question. This is one of the um, things that have recently come up with the PUI enhancement subgroup here at Yale that Allison is leading. They found this a little confusing, primarily because the scope and content notes that are shown at the top don't have a header. Um, that was an intentional design choice by Cherry Hill, but we're not, we're, that's one of those ones we're actually rethinking. Um, so I don't know if we're going to handle that with a plugin or something else, but it would be um, customizable with a plugin. But those things aren't always so easy to figure out how to do, in, uh, in all honesty, and you can't just easily tweak it in the staff interface. Um, but hopefully there will be an example of how to handle that um, with a plugin uh, shortly, because I know we're, that's one of the ones that we're looking at. Um, and that's another question, too. Yeah, we went back and forth about the abstract versus the scope and content note. But uh, the way we ended up going was just to use the scope and content note in place of the abstract if it was there. Um, so again, that may not have been the best decision and maybe something we want to add as a more easily customizable feature in the future. But hopefully there'll be a plugin that demonstrates how to do both of those things in the near future. And I just want to respond to Ryan Edwards' question about the OAI PMH responder for Primo. And um, Archive Space does have that, and it should help with uh, uh, systems like Primo to harvest records from Archive Space. Hi, Emma. This is Annie. I'm responding to your question about um, Lyricis hosting um, and upgrading to the new uh, public user interface. I think if you just kick off um, a, a, a a, a user request ticket um, that you would like to upgrade. They'll probably get that in their queue. Um, ours, our upgrade happened sort of by surprise. I asked them several months ago when the new public user interface um, release happened, when that was when our our change would happen, and I think they queued it right up at that point. So I think all you just need to do is is submit a request. 
We are recording this, and I'll be posting the link to this as soon as it's available, and we're happy to share the slides as well. Hi, this is Susan. I want to respond to the William and Mary Library's question about the um, plugin for Aon to work with archive space. And Aon is currently working on that. Um, and they are, have told us last week that they're very close to um, coming out with the first iteration of that. And we at Harvard have an Aon project manager, um, Madeline Rackley, who um, has been working, a, who used to work for Aon, in fact, but is um, working with Aon in terms of um, the specs for that. So I'm really hopeful there'll be something out there soon for people to use. I might take a crack at trying to respond to Alexandra's uh, Hi, this is Annie. I'm just testing to see if we've lost audio altogether or if we are um, just waiting for Mark. OK. <laughs> Great. So um, our in, in response to, to um, let's see, the last question, Vivian Lee's question, um, our PUI is the front end of our live database. So whenever I make changes in the back end in the staff interface, uh, and, and publish those changes, they are live. So it's very easy and very fast for me to update finding aids. Hey, everybody. So hopefully I was able to reconnect successfully. Uh, but I, it looks like Christine answered uh, the previous question from Wayne State, I believe. Um, but yeah, I'll just again say, you know, with Harvard and other folks doing uh, integrations, hopefully there'll be more and more of those um, examples and more features added to the core base, uh, to the core code base um, between now and then. But there'll, there'll definitely be more explorations with that. In case folks can hear me, um, there's a question about uh, security and the PUI. Um, and I think, yeah, Annie, you had already started to answer some of that in terms of, you know, the uh, being able to search the PUI as soon as you update the staff interface. I'll also add with security, we haven't actually done our security review of the PUI yet, but um, given that I don't think there's any connections to make any database updates um, from the PUI and there's no login options, I don't think there's going to be issues with um, security, but um, that's something we still need to look in to make sure, you know, there's no ways that folks could get into the system and get data out some other way that would not be in the PUI that's not published. Um, but I think that's just a, you know, those types of testings and um, patches will um, you know, just as they did with the uh, previous PUI. And but Christine or others may know more about that too. At this point, I'm not sure. Hi, this is Annie. I am. Um, uh Ask, answering the question about branding of the PUI. So if, if you are using the Lyricist hosted version, it's very easy. You can just send them images or text to add to your front page or to your headers, and they will add that in for you. I can't really speak to um, non-hosted solutions, so I'll uh, let Mark or Susan speak to that, or someone else. Yeah, so, so we are hosted, so we'll be doing the same type of thing that Annie had mentioned. Um, Oh, sorry. Look, Susan, you wanted to chime in, so I'll mute myself. No problem, Mac. I was just going to say it's the only uh, site not ho not hosted that, yeah, um, it's equally easy on Ireland in terms of the branding. And in fact, that was the first thing we did, started working on with our implementation, um, is just to start getting the look and feel of our, our Harvard discovery system done. 
But I, I would just add, even if you're um, doing it yourself, it does require some technical know-how because there's no way to just, you know, easily do it in the staff interface like some folks may be um, accustomed to, like in a content management system like uh, WordPress or um, Drupal, which those are hard to set up in their own right, but sometimes can be very easy to customize just in the staff interface. So some of those features still do require some technical know-how um, to, to get into place. Some are very easy to do, um, but some can be much more difficult. And I think everyone's just learning with, with the new PUI how to customize it because it is uh, different than the original PUI. So Laris, this is, um, uh, you know, that was part of the thing too that they had to come to grips with when it was released just about three months ago was, um, you know, learning how to rebrand it in a slightly different way. We have time for a few more questions if um, anyone has anything else they'd like to uh, submit to the chat. Uh, I'm just kind of scrolling through to make sure we haven't missed anything. And if we have, go, feel free to submit that again just to make sure that we cover that. All right, so um, I think this is a good time to wrap things up then. Thank you all for joining us for the webinar today and the recording. This webinar has been recorded and it will be available as soon as possible and I'll send out the link to that um, when it's ready. If you all have additional questions, please feel free to email us and we'll get right in touch with you. Um, thank you all and have a great afternoon.